Hello there, and welcome to another episode of Weird Music on the Glumberger Channel. Of course, a show where we're taking little dives into the weird and peculiar albums out there, of course. <laughs> so, uh, today, we're going to continue our foray into the sonic assaults of the amazing band Swans, with a look at their 1986 experimental industrial ish album that saw major changes to the Swans lineup and started the incorporation of you know many new ideas and instruments that completely turned Swans into this in you know to this other entity almost <laughs> while still maintaining that incredibly bleak and unsettling outlook upon the world of course. We're looking at of course the first of two albums released in 1986, the legendary Greed. So as we're going to be doing with these Swans episode, we'll of course ask ourselves, who were Swans when Greed was recorded? <laughs> well, the lineup for Greed incorporated many musicians. Of course, at the forefront you have uh, Michael Giroir uh, at the forefront of the album, performing vocals, samples, tapes, piano, bass guitar, even production duties as well. As well, Norman Westberg remains uh, part of the lineup as the main guitarist for the band, whilst Harry Crosby returns for bass duties. However, after this is when the lineup starts to change around a bit. As instead of Rolly Musselman on drums, Greed has three drummers, <laughs> uh, all performing on the album. You know, uh, being uh, Ronaldo Gonzalez, Ted Parsons, and Ivan Nahim. It's also here, though that Swans was joined by one of the most formidable forces in the whole of Swans history, I feel. Like, you know, uh, maybe some people will disagree, but I genuinely believe so, you know. Um, this is this is where uh, the wonderful and brilliant uh, Jarbo made her debut appearance with Swans on the album Greed. Not actually so much true, I think uh, her actual first appearance was on the single um, Time is Money Bastard, but whatever, whatever. This was the debut album that she was on, is what I mean. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, uh, Jarbo uh, appears for the first time on a Swans album and performing backing vocals, of course. And so with this lineup change, you know, and, you know, uh, you know Jiro performing many different duties as well, we get a major change to the whole Swan sound, you know, which starts to expand upon the assaulting nature of Swan music with the use of different instruments and different ideas and stuff. And it's all quintessentially Swans, no doubt, with it still having that phenomenal industrial structure, and yet it manages to explore different things within the Swans framework, if that makes sense. And so, let's just dive into it all. Let's just dive into it all. Uh, hold it up correctly, Greed opens up with the very slow tempoed and atmospheric Fool, which immediately opens up with this very heavy and almost discordant piano, whilst uh, Jiro just croons out with these incredibly elongated vocals that really start out, you know, in the chest and, you know, come out in such a large expansive way. You know, there's an emphasis and power to his vocals, which is, you know, I feel, you know, quite starkly different to the previous two albums. And I believe I remember this, um, you know, this being a point mentioned in the uh, documentary Where Does the Body End, as this was a suggestion from Jarbo herself. At the time in Swans, Michael was shouting and screaming his words. I suggested he try something new, something different. I really wanted to hear him attempt to do long, heavy, deep, kind of from the, from the deep in the chest notes, instead of just this, the shouting and the talking and the, and, and, and the screaming, do more, more like vocalizing from a singing point of view. Then I had suggested during a break, you know, just to the door, just try that. And so, yeah, I think it's brilliant, to be fair. You know, whilst, whilst Filth and Cop, you know, offer so much heaviness and anguish and torment in their performances, 
Uh, this suggestion from Jarbo, though, really allowed uh, Jiro to come out with some amazing vocal techniques, something he would continue to explore in so many of the Swans' albums. And by the time we get to the really late stuff now, you've got Jiro's vocals sounding like their own drone instrument, pretty much. And uh, I believe the genesis of uh, such of such started, you know, right here on Greed with Jarbo, you know, whose experimental nature was able to, you know, draw so many different, you know, more concepts and ideas out of Swans than what they were currently exploring. I would argue, it, it's brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. But to get to get back to uh, get to back to the track in question, you know, Fool continues along with this very dark atmospheric tone that you know, it sounds so absurdly intimidating with the drums slowly pounding away and you know such emphasis on that slow tempo you know, the guitars climbing up and up out of the darkness you know and in terms of what swans had established at the time it's such a different opener to what one might have been used to from the band you know and and to be fair the lyrics do retain uh, very much the same qualities that you'll often see in Jura's lyrics, you know, the existential outlook, you know, crying out, you know, he, he, in particular, he cries out lines of, I'll lie to myself, I'll lie down here, I'll lie down beside you, I'll lie to myself. Before you actually get this visceral gut punch of, I'll cut off my right hand and stand in your shadow. And the way he performs that line is, oh, it's a brilliant moment on the song, I feel. <laughs> But yeah, like, go back to the lyrics though, much of the song seems to give off this concept of submission and, you know, to someone so much more powerful and, you know, with that slow tempo and those, you know, because those guitars are crawling up and up and the piano itself as well, it's all so bleak and unsettling and it's a brilliantly dark way to open up the new chapter in Swan's discography. <laughs> so, yeah, goodness, there was a lot to discuss there, actually. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, Greed, Greed moves on though, it moves on to the second track, Anything For You, which returns us to that more established swan style of music, you know, with very heavy and harsh rhythmic drums and that almost atonal, atonal guitar chords just loudly clanging within that structure. And it's such a quintessential swan style, of course, you know, albeit with a much slower, being much slower in its tempo, of course, you know, really letting the kick drum force it into that really tight and rigid structure. And lyrically again, this is one that is overt in its almost uh, sexual submissive imagery. <laughs> you know, Jiro Roll taking the role as a submissive, crying out the refrain of, I'll do anything for you. And then you get to the repeated lines of, hold it in, take it out, take it out of me, which ugh, sounds really uncomfortable, you know, something you know, it, it's almost an expression of, you know, the act and it's sounding so ugly and repugnant in its own weird way, right? <laughs> Very interesting though, because for us as listeners, it places us in this really uncomfortable position with it feeling so unrelenting and bleak in its presentation. And for me, it's perhaps one of the highlights of the album. There's just something so horrible and jaded about this particular track. And so we move on to track three and this one, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence about. It. So, you know, uh, Greed does incorporate a lot of new elements, new ideas, and things. And you know, I do enjoy it for that. You know, that they really try to, you know, just draw more out of themselves as a band, basically. And whilst a lot of the new ideas are great, there's a lot of them that I'm not too sure about. And this is one that I really struggle with. So, you know, nobody pushes along with this very peculiar pacing indeed, you know, it's got this, it's looping this very unusual ascending, you know, um, climb that reduces back down to silence before beginning up again, consisting of this ultimate, also consisting of this very prominent vocal performance from Jarbo, as well as very fuzzy guitar and bass and a sparse bass line. And this structure tends to occur throughout pretty much the entirety of the track, I feel. And you know, you've got Jiro just singing in this really miserable drawl. It's an existential look at oneself, feeling very out of place in time with the very essence of his being, arguably, before you get to this final outro section of where glory is just repeated over and over, whilst you know, the drums actually come in a bit more prominently at this point. But it's all still so absurdly sparse, you know, in terms of the actual rhythm being offered. And it, you know, it's interesting, but there's something about this particular song that just doesn't really do much for me, and it 
I don't know, it might actually be the pacing of it, you know, it's weird because I do like slow slow music, you know, slow doomy music for example, things that where the tempos are really slow. But something about this just I don't know, I don't know. It's, it might be the fact it's just climbing up to the same point, going back down to the same point, up to the same point, back down to the same point. Maybe it's it's a bit hard for me to, to get my head around, but I just thought I'd mention it, you know, because you know we've talked about a lot of different swan songs and I think this is one of the first times I've come across one that actually I don't really rate all that much, but you know what? Opinions are opinions and yeah, whatever, whatever. It was bound to happen. We'll move on though, we'll move on though. Uh, on to track four, Stupid Child. And this one starts off with such a rushed and hurried pace, you know, as though it's blindly trying to reach its destination. And what I like with this one is that we get this peculiar run of instruments which are kind of built around the heavy thump of the drums and it's like all the instruments are just sliding along their notes you know creating this very peculiar sense of uh, momentum and movement that I find very interesting in this track and you also get very weird unsettling sounds from the guitars the pianos and even the bass that really help fill up the sound uh, the, the, the space in the song I mean <laughs> lyrically as well Another uncomfortable track from Jiro, one that describes this very peculiar relationship between two people that, you know, it perhaps borders on the infantile and twists it to this very unsettling and uncomfortable place with its, you know, violent imagery. And as well though, but, uh, another thing to mention with this one, according to uh, Genius.com, a contributor made a note that this particular track seems to have parallels to the track Helpless Child from Soundtracks for the Blind with the song's titles and lyrics seemingly exploring the same concepts and ideas. And, you know, I think this you know, further pushes sort of something I do seem to mention a lot, how you know, Jira has very particular things that he likes to explore in his music, and you know, it, it goes across the entire spectrum of the Swans' history, you know, t technically. It's very interesting, very interesting. And so moving on, we get to the album's title track of Greed. And I think this is a particular highlight on the album though. It pushes along with this very industrial sounding drum pattern, whilst you once again have Jarbo vocalising over the top of it all. And you know, the guitars very angrily burst into the scene with such an uncomfortable presence. You know? It's very interesting and you get this incredibly long opening before, uh, you know, of just this, before even the bass comes in actually. And when it does, it all sounds so lo-fi and nasty, just plunging the song into these absolute horrible sonic depths. <laughs> and it's roughly halfway through the song though uh, that Jiro comes in with the lyrics, you know, which mostly repeats the refrain of nothing will go wrong. And it's such an unusual track though, like it pulses along with such sinister undertones whilst lyrically it feels like you know a character trying to comfort another. But it doesn't feel mutual or symbiotic, there's something about the way swans present their music that makes the whole thing sound just uncomfortable and nasty and as though you know there's this underlying dark element hidden deep underneath what's actually you know, happening. <laughs> Moving right along though uh, we get to the sixth track Heaven which opens up with this really unsettling myriad of drones before it just suddenly jump cuts to this almost really sparse peculiar fuzzed out guitar line that crawls around pushed along by these very tribalistic drums that pound and pound with such a slow tempo again. Whilst over the top of that, you know, Jiro is droning out with these really unusual uh, vocal styles, you know, howling out another existential dirge that literally places us in the afterlife as we find ourselves in heaven. <laughs> and this one, so unsettling again, it's a song about heaven, you know, beautiful idyllic place, you know, where everything's great and wonderful. And yet, in terms of like the sounds and stuff that they're making, it's all being presented in such a nasty guttural style that you know it makes it's almost like there's nothing wonderful or beautiful about it in the slightest, you know? And it's an interesting angle to take, I would argue. It certainly paints this, you know, very unique picture that places us in this very nasty place, you know, a very nasty version of the afterlife, especially in this context. But um, going back to the track though, I love the ending of this one, you know, it's the instruments all have consistently continued their slow crawl towards the climax, but it's Jiro who just howls and howls with these really long droning notes before he just starts screaming and shouting 
and then nothing. It all just stops. <laughs> and I think it's brilliant. I think that's brilliant. Like, you know, big sudden endings like that. It's so good. And so with that, uh, we get onto Greed's final track, Money is Flesh. And so this is how we close off Greed with this very peculiar and very messy sounding track that very prominently features these sort of trumpet or brass sounds that it may very well be a sample from, from Dio because I can't seem to find any credit for it. Uh, so it might be that, but I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. Um, in any case though, you've got this, you know, you've got that pushing, pushing things along, you know, along with this drum beat that feel like it's all ready to go. But it's like the drums are staggering itself on specific beats while the rest of the instruments build up this, you know, it's very nasty soundscape. And lyrically, this is one that, you know, comes back to the sort of anger that Jira ha has from experiences within the working class. You know, pushing up this disdain of, you know, working his body raw for money, you know. It mostly hinges on, you know, the constantly repeated refrain of, you deserve it. And I feel, I feel as though it's perhaps purposely vague um, as to specifically what is deserved, you know? Is it just the money for the job well done, or is it that you deserve the destruction to one's body because for whatever reason, you know? Almost like punishing oneself, perhaps. But in any case, though, it, it just pushes and pushes and pushes and pushes, and then, like, the last one, over again. And so, yeah, like, with that, you've uh, technically ended what feels like one of the short Swans albums. Um, uh, I wrote that down, but it's actually the next album, Holy Money, that's actually a little bit shorter, but whatever. Of course, uh, subsequent re-releases of Greek, though, have packed it out with additional material, as well as partnering up with its sister album of Holy Money, which is the one I've got here, but more on that in a future episode. And so, to summarise my feelings on this one, you know, this perhaps ranks a little further down in my rating of Swan albums across their whole discography, like, the introduction of Jarbo is brilliant. I feel like she adds this really brilliant, like, edge to the soundscapes that the band explore and stuff, and I really love her contributions, especially, like, especially we'll get into, into later stuff, like, it's phenomenal what she gets up to. But I think on Greed, though, I would argue that her talents didn't get utilised enough, you know? And there's something about Greed as a record, this, it just feels a little disparate, as though they didn't actually have a very clear direction of, you know, how to consolidate each and every recording into one cohesive album experience, you know? And maybe that's in part to all the various different members coming and going during the recording of this album, or, you know, maybe they, they wanted to stray away from the sort of noisy stuff they were doing earlier, but, you know, may, maybe not, I'm, I'm not too sure to be honest, but... Although there is a lot to enjoy on Greed, you know, and there's some really brilliant tracks on there, I'm not really sure it does enough though. I mean, especially when you consider the idea that, you know, we're following up Filth and Cop, you know, which in my opinion are two brilliant early Swans albums, you know. Um, yeah, Greed kind of just falls a little bit flat in, in light of that. And I feel like it's a bit mean to say, but it's just, uh, like I said, it's just my opinion of it. And, um, yeah, it's, it, it is what it is, though. I mean, to be fair, though, you know, as well as Greed, though, we do end up with Holy Money following this up, which I would say does make some vast improvements on many of the ideas explored on Greed. But, of course, we'll have to get that into the episode on Holy Money now, won't we? And so, to, uh, before, we go, uh, before we close off, to go into a little bit more about the various versions of this album. Most re-releases of uh, Greed ended up including the addition of the Time of Money Bastard single at the end of the album, adding the single, the track Sealed and Skin, and then a longer mix of Time is Money. And this is a very interesting track in Swan's discography as it utilises the use of a nail gun to create this really unsettling percussive element that dominates so much of the song. You know, it's so industrial and, you know, Oh, just overbearing, it's fantastic stuff. And so, a little digging around as well, apparently the very release of the Time as Money Bastard single was the first official appearance of Jarvo on Swan's release, as she is credited as having performed Scream. Which I think is a bit funny, of course. <laughs> but in any case, it's another absurdly aggressive foreboding track that you should easily have expected from Swan's, of course. 
And, but it also incorporated new ideas like that we've been discussing as well. And I think it's, it's very interesting. Like, you know, normally I don't mention the singles and stuff, but I feel like the Time is Money one is definitely worth mentioning. It's, a, it's kind of an important sort of like, what do you call it, like a transition track, you know, maybe. I'll give it a And so, one final thing to mention. Um, I touched upon this briefly in the video on COP, that the version I have of the album is on a compilation album, combining COP, Young God, Greed and Holy Money, all together into this double album feature. So whilst COP and Young God are relatively untouched, even adding some bonus singles at the end of Young God, which I actually forgot to mention on the video on COP, uh, disc 2 of Greed and Holy Money does this very weird thing of rearranging the track orderings of both albums into a single album experience. And the contrarian in me, uh, I like things as they are, or at least how I heard it when I originally approached it, if that actually makes any sense. Like, uh, I, if I ever do a video on F sharp, A sharp, Infinity by Godspeed Your Black Emperor, this is gonna be, you know, uh, what's the word, like, I'm gonna be contradicting myself, what I'm about to say here, but more on that later. I, the contrarian me, likes things as they were originally envisioned to be, if that makes sense. And I find this alternative version of Greed and Holy Money to feel a bit more bloated. Um, and I don't know why they decided to do it like that, though, you know? Um, I'd much preferred it if uh, this two was essentially Greed and Holy Money as their track listings were originally, instead of this kind of jumbled mess of both albums. And I don't know, this, I find there's something really weird about that, you know, it, it just, this particular album, it kind of stands out as a bit of a novelty amongst my, you know, well this, this particular version of the album, I mean, it kind of stands out as a bit of a novelty amongst my collection of Swans albums as a result now, because there's just something weird about it, like I, I just wanted to mention it here, because, you know, um, it might just be me that feels this way, who knows, who knows, but in any case though, I do find it unusual. Because, I don't know, I, I would have much preferred it if I just had a version of Greed as is, a version of Holy Money as is, instead of it, you know, just constantly jumping around from track to track between two albums, you know? It, and as well, I don't really enjoy the structuring and, you know, the, the flow of these two combined albums anyway, right? When you, when you have the both albums separately, you kind of, um, it's kind of interesting to be able to compare and contrast the two albums that are both, you know, part of the same whole, if that makes sense. But you have, like, the clear two sides of it, I feel. You've got the greed side, the holy money side. And then jumbling together, though, it kind of just muddies up a lot of the, a lot of it all. And, yeah, I just thought I'd mention it, you know. I, I, I seem to be, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And so, with that, I think we're coming to the end of today's episode of Weird Music. You know, greed, it's, um... It's an interesting Swans album, no doubt about it. You know, in fact, all of them are. But to be fair, I I like how Greed does try to step away from the you know the onslaught of brutalist noise that the band established with both Filth and Cop, and uh, start to enter arguably more melodic territories. And it's not because I dislike the brutalist noise side of the band, but rather it's because it shows so much more creativity and breadth that the band has as a whole, like how much they able to achieve and stuff and what they're capable of and it's interesting to see a band showcase so many different styles within their thing it's why i enjoy the, the works of swans so much there's so many different eras to themselves and so many different things they do and did and i think it's fascinating fascinating but as, as nice as it is though i'm unsure if every concept and idea actually hits the mark on greed as some of the tracks just don't work for me for some reason you know, some of them are great ideas, and they sometimes feel a little bit poorly executed. And some of them, you know, I would say, not the best ideas, but actually feel brilliantly executed. It, it's interesting, it's very, very disparate. It does seem though, like you said, a lot of these ideas are going to be further pushed out on holy money, and in some cases, literally improved with alternative versions of specific tracks. Of course, we'll have to wait for our episode on holy money on another day. <laughs> But for now, I would like to thank you for watching today's episode of Weird Music. I wish you all the best. Take care and bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.